Welcome to the topic lecture on inheritance patterns. This is our second topic in chapter 19. Here are the objectives for this chapter. Please let me know if you need any help with these objectives. In this lecture we are going to discuss Mendel's experiments, his findings, and their basis within the cell. In many of your classes you will have heard of Mendel and his experiments. Still, I'm going to quickly re review these concepts. Mendel performed all of his experiments in pea plants and looked at a variety of traits, but the important aspect of his research was that he selected traits that are determined by only one gene, and that each of his selective traits have alleles on separate chromosomes. This allowed Mendel to isolate out genes to review inheritance patterns. This is an important note because genetics are a very trick, is a tr very tricky field to study as rarely one gene controls a trait. By isolating these traits, Mendel was able to work out several basic laws of inheritance long before we even understood what was being passed along from parent to offspring to make these traits. As Mendel performed his experiments, he worked out a lot of key concepts associated with genetic inheritance. Remember, at this point, science still had not determined what molecules were actually passing on the inherited traits. These are terms that you should be very familiar with by now, so I'm not going to go through them, but make sure you review them. Using all the information he gathered, Mendel developed two laws of genetic inheritance, the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. This is a key concept I want you to learn in this topic. I want you to be able to connect genetic inheritance to what happens in meiosis. Okay, so let's look at how Mendel's laws actually apply to chromosome movement. The first law is the law of segregation. As you can see in our parent cell, there are four chromosomes and they are in two pairs. In the law of segregation, you can see how each gamete ends up with either a green or yellow chromosome and either a plain or starred purple chromosome. This is exactly what the law of segregation states, that the maternal and paternal chromosomes are going to separate so that each gamete receives only one copy of the trait. The law of independent assortment applies to the group of chromosomes that ends up in the gamete. This law states that just because you have a cretin chromosome does not mean that you will end up with a starred chromosome. Thus each chromosome will sort independently of all the other chromosomes. This gives rise to the chance for a gamete to contain only maternal genetics or a gamete that is a complete mix of the two and every variation in between. Pretty impressive for a monk who didn't even know about DNA, right? The last note on genetics for this topic is the impact of mutations on the cell. As you should know by this point in the term, there are a variety of mutations and some of them can result in some very dramatic changes to the cell and the organism. As you can see from the slide here, we have a wild type protein. This is a protein that is what the protein should be in the majority of the population or the unmutated form. We then have three types of mutation where we can see a protein no longer able to perform its function. These can be caused by a variety of changes in the amino acid sequence. We talked about how these can occur back in Unit 2, so make sure you brush up on these concepts if you are feeling rusty. At the opposite end of the mutation scale are those that actually give the proteins new functionality. These proteins can be just as problematic for the cell as a loss of function mutation, and these mutations can arise in the same way the loss of function mutations come about. The important note about this is just how delicate a balance our cells exist in, and any variation in the protein codes from the genome can cause a significant disease throughout the body. This is the end of this topic. Let me know if you have any questions about it.